We are live. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have a well, actually, it's, it's officially six o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Diana Vassello. I'm the president of the CROA board, and I'm here in the room with our liaisons to the RFP transition process. And we also have uh, Brian Kinzel and Celia McFadden, two of our board members who are online and would be listening in. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a good group here, and I think we're going to get a lot of really good questions. So uh, what we'll do is I'll make a brief introduction to the process, then I'm going to turn it over to David, and then we will accept questions from the residents. Uh, please, if you can, if you can raise your hand, we will have Patrick unmute you so you can ask your question so everyone can be heard. Uh, we still have some people joining the room, so we will continue to add people as they join in. So um, the first part of our process with the RFP, and I'm hopefully all of you are aware if you've been following along with the process, is based on our new charter, we as a homeowners association are required to do an RFP process. And we have had some questions as to why now, and why now is because it is mandated in the charter that was approved just about a year ago. So last September, uh, we started the RFP process with three board liaisons, and that would be Brian, Kenzel, David Anderson, and myself, and we put together an RFP committee who started the process by looking out into the industry of all possible companies nationwide. We looked at any, co any company that handled similar size properties. Uh, similar amount of communities, had a uh, good reputation in the community based on CAI, which is the, uh, the professional organization that manages uh, homeowners associations um, and training. So that's where we started. We started out with about 270 uh, homeowners uh, co management companies who were possible candidates. We then narrowed those down to a group of companies that we thought could handle the size that were able to manage in Florida or even interested in managing in Florida and ask them for a um, RFQ, which was a request for information. Basically what kind of uh, company they were, what they would offer celebration, if they were interested in celebration. And from that, we got 14 responses. We'll make sure it's been a while since we looked at those. We had 14 responses of companies who wanted to present, um, who were interested, who showed interest in celebration and managing celebration. Uh, from those 14, we had six companies submit the actual proposals. Uh, we had six management companies submit or the complete request for proposal. And at that point, we narrowed it down to two companies who we invited in for interviews. They were on-site interviews. They all, actually the six companies came in and actually toured the property uh, with the board, with some board members who gave them a three hour tour of, of celebration. Then they, uh, then they submitted their request for proposal. Their RFPs came in, we reviewed them as a board and narrowed that down to two companies that we invited on-site to give us proposals. And that, those videos you can see on the town hall website. So that is where we come today. Um, we are here to answer questions. We have two finalists and the two finalists are Century Management and Grand Manors. Um, we will, as a board, make our final vote on Monday, August the 9th. So that is the next step in the process. But we are, you know, we are here tonight to answer any questions that you might have about the process, any questions about the company, and we'll do our best to answer them and give you the information that you're looking for. Um, before we get started though, one more thing, I would like to um, recognize the members of the key committees that were part of this process. We had um, three committees that were pretty much focused on the RFP process for the last six months. We had an RFP task force, we had the technology committee, and we had the finance committee. And each one of those committees reviewed the items that was in their area of expertise. And the RFP committee created the actual RFP 
and the statement of work based on what we were going to request the companies to bid on. The technology committee reviewed all the technology side of the business, where they all the software, the data storage, the safety and security. And the finance committee looked at budgeting, staffing, uh, and where our expenses would be in line with the new budget, with the new company. Okay. So um, that is where we stand right now. And I would like to thank those members of those committees, because believe me, we put probably thousands of hours between the committee hours, the board hours, to get to the point that we are tonight. So that's where I'd like to start the process. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to David Anderson, who is to my right, uh, and he will start the process with questions. I do see a couple people maybe already have their hands up, and I will also try and monitor the chat as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Anderson. I'm glad you're here. Just a couple other things. Uh, Diana provided a, a great overview, and I'm glad we started in this whole process a year ago. When the charter passed in March of 2020, we knew that the clock was ticking. We had, uh, what is it, 18, 20 months. And uh, so we, when this current contract was over, so we started literally a year ago. This has all been done through a blend of executive privileged discussions because we're dealing with personnel and management protocols. Uh, but also trying to keep the community engaged throughout the process. So you've read or had access to the monthly articles in the Celebration News, uh, various briefings uh, with the board over time. And then we also had just a comment about the committees. Uh, you mentioned the, the task force and the other two committees. We Through each of our seven standing committees that we have, we asked for feedback from our residents. We had the committees engage. And all that fed into the revised scope of work. Significant for the RFP task force was revising that statement of work. What's the contract look like? And for context, the statement of work that we're operating under today was basically drafted 25 years ago. And it's been appended and amended and shuffled around and reorganized a few little patches here and there. But this was a major, major, major rework. And one last thanks I would like to just make sure is on the tables who's helped us move through those 25 years has been CCMC. That's the management company that was initially hired for celebration and is maintaining the contract uh, th through this time and through, through the end until we transition to a new company. So uh, with that, our focus now is on your questions, your statements to us, whether you have an opinion based on what you've read or a question you want to ask about the process or something moving forward. We have up to two hours here if we need it, and we'll take questions. We have some in writing, but we're going to give priority to those who are here, and then we'll address those that have come in in writing. We've also posted maybe a dozen questions already right where the videos are on the resident-only portion of the website. So there we already have uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions. So we've highlighted a lot of those. Some of the questions that have come in have, have helped to generate that. And there will be more that get posted as questions come up tonight or, uh, um, and, and then in future days as we make our decision, as Diana said, we'll make our decision on Monday and then we'll start some, some ratification of that and next week and then a transition. And uh, there'll be questions that come up along the way with that. So keep your eye open on that FAQ section uh, as, as that evolves. So let's start with any question that we have. We have someone with a hand up that you see. And again, try to limit your comments with our limited time, um, maximum three minutes. And if you can be shorter, that'd be great. And we'll address them to the extent we can. And we're thrilled everyone's here. This is great. We'd rather be live, but uh, yeah. we'll get we'll get, eventually. Eventually. we'll get there eventually. We'll get there eventually. All right. I don't see any hands up. Anyone want to put their hand up and ask the first question? And if we don't have a question, we'll uh, we can go to the ones that go. came in in David writing. David Romero, can you unmute yourself? Hello, David. There we go. Hi. Um, I have a question about uh, diversity and inclusion. I, I uh, 
I looked at the uh, pictures of Sentry. I haven't studied the other one as much, but I looked at the the company picture of Sentry, and it, it appeared to be all white, um, just from an appearance. Um, do they have a diversity and inclusion um, procedure, anything in uh, policy in place? I'm going to ask David, or excuse me, Brian, to answer that question. Brian did an on-site visit at Sentry Management and can answer that. Yeah, I actually went last Friday. I went to Grand Manor's offices in Plano, Texas, and I went to Sentry offices on Monday. I was, um, Cindy went on Monday with me, and Jackson Mummy went last Friday with me. I can assure you that they have a lot of diversity in their workforce from an African American perspective, from a Hispanic perspective, from a white perspective. Portuguese speaking people, we talked about it from, from the value of call centers and stuff like that. Uh, and actually I'd seen your question, I think it was actually even put in writing and I went into Century and Grand Manor's write-ups and they, they, they talked about the fact that they have diversity inclusion programs. Um, so they do have that. And as we thought about it from the perspective of you know, serving the residents of celebration, as an example, when we looked at the call centers and the ability to speak to, we, you know, we have a lot of Brazilian contingent, we have the um, Latin American contingent and stuff like that. They had those capabilities to even speak those languages directly to people, the phone systems and stuff like that with the call centers. Okay. Um, and then from a sexuality uh, standpoint, do they, uh, do they discriminate or do they open up to anybody um, in that manner? I did not specifically ask that question, but both companies, we, in, in going from the 270 companies down to the six companies in the two, we looked at companies that have leading reputations in the industry, whether you're talking about CAI and industry stuff and stuff like that. I don't think they could be successful today if they discriminated. And that's really how we got comfortable with them is we tried we believe we found six of the best companies by far, and we believe that we have picked two companies that are the two best companies, and either one would be good, and we're trying to pick the best of the best, and we don't believe they could be successful with any discriminatory type policies. I appreciate that. I'm heavily involved in that with Disney, and, and it just made me think to ask it. Thank you so much for your time. It's a, it's a very fair question, and it's a tough question, and I appreciate it, actually. Brian. Brian, I'll actually jump in if, I, if it's okay. And both both companies from the, the research that I've done on my own are um, very, uh, the best expression to say it is both are very inclusive in, in all aspects. So I was happy to see that. Very good. All right, Kevin, our next question comes from Eileen Barr. Can you unmute yourself and ask the question, Mrs. Barr? Oh, yes, Eileen Barr, 1138 Mosaic Drive. Um, Jerry and I have been very concerned over the last couple of years about uh, the community, the management being able to form a very good email list that accurately reflects who actually lives here. And then when people leave, they get deleted and when people come, they get added. Uh, and also an email list that can be used for various items, uh, interest, whatever. One of the companies, and I think it was Grand Manor, but I'm not 100% sure, or maybe it was Century, who said that is a priority for them. They're effective at putting together a good email list. They feel they're about, they can get to about 95% of uh, all owners, which is probably as good as you can get. I was just wondering if that was true for both companies. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question because I know we we send out that QR code uh, pretty much in every mailing to get people to sign up with their email address. Both of these companies offer very strong online presence and very strong uh, resident software where the software where you will be able to access your account you'll be able to see your balances and all that is based on you can update your own information and put your email in and your contact information in the system online so i think it'll be easier for the residents to keep that online um, both companies have a very strong commitment to technology and making sure they gather all that information 
I think you'll see a much broader use of email addresses. Um, but again, the residents have to be open to give us that email. And I can see Brian unmute, unmuted himself. Yeah, and, and let me add to you a little, since I had the um, pleasure of visiting both of them, in the call centers, when you call in, they actually call up your resident account online. They're, they're trained in how to um, professionally greet you, how to go through the call. Jackson even listened in online to how they ran a couple of calls. In that process, they're by they actually follow up with you if they don't have an email address, if they don't have a contact number for a cell phone, for example, or something like that. In picking the two finalists, we looked heavily, heavily at software. I mean, my, my interest here in saying this is that if we have a good portal, and my vision is we could have a portal where somebody could come in to town hall, yeah, they could look at their account online, they could look at the town calendar, you know, that maybe they could also click on something from the Celebrations Foundation, click on something for the CCD, so that they have a reason to want to go there and they'd have an interest in giving us more information. And when you talk about something like the um, holiday concert, you know, we wouldn't have multiple sign-ons, it'd be one sign-on, so it would be as user-friendly as possible. So I think that will help help us get the information you're talking about, Eileen, and we'll actually prevent a technological way for when they call in somebody will know we don't have it. Yeah, just to, to dovetail on that, technology has been a priority. It's one of our cornerstones, of course. But the other thing we ask the companies is how do you deal, and this goes to Eileen's question a little more broadly, how do you deal with those who are not as technology, technologically savvy? How do you make sure you have an update list on that. And so they also address that. So they're sensitive to the fact that 100% of our residents may not be technolog technologically savvy. Good addition. All right. Do you so, have any other hands up? No other hands up. No other hands up. Are we done? <laughs> I don't think no. we're done. No, there's, some, there's some questions. Sure some, there's someone raise your hand. Raise your hand. Questions. We want to hear from you. Okay. <laughs> What's that? She's clapping. That's good. We have 38 people out there. 38 so people. Good. Someone has a question. We or, Vanessa, oh, good. We have a question from Vanessa Winter. Who? Vanessa? Vanessa, I don't recognize Who? the name. I, recognize the name? I, I think she moved. Oh, she moved. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and she I'm working on it. <laughs> She's working on it. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> Just kidding. I, celebration will always be my home. Um, I actually have two different questions now um, based upon what you had just stated. Um, where do you think that the two companies that you have on the forefront now, where do you think they can take celebration to that next level where we're missing in technology, that, that bridge that we needed to become a little more independent? How do you think these two companies will be able to accomplish that? Can I take a shot at that? I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> I'm waiting for the room to say yes or no, I can't hear it. Okay. Um, we actually, from when we did the interviews, we asked both companies if they would be comfortable with Celebration owning its own data as an example. And, we, and they both said yes. We asked them if they would be comfortable with us having celebration email addresses for town hall employees as opposed to a Grand Manor or Century email address. They said yes. Um, you know, we asked them how we could take the technology they were using and really possibly replace our website, you know, do portals and stuff like that and really try to push it forward. They were happy to do that. They were happy to work with the technology committee and CCMC has done that, but they were happy to continue that and even try to grow it some. So I think they're happy to go down that path. And I think we have the ability to push in that direction over the next couple, three years. Anybody in the room want to add to that? You're muted. I guess we're muted. Are we, we muted? muted? Yes, you are. <laughs> oh, are we okay now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, one addition to that, I mean, technology and what Brian just said, I think is central to that, Vanessa. But the other piece is the whole strategic planning and engaging with us as a partner. We found that from each of the companies, each of them could help 
with us as we try to set direction for celebration, looking to our next 25 years, you know, after we celebrate this 25. So, so I think the partnership, the professionalism they would bring, helping to guide that. So it's not just project-based, but really envisioning celebration. What do we want it to feel like and look like uh, for, for all of us? David, you've got about 40 questions that the community sent in. Some people may be bashful, probably wise to pick off some of those. Couple hands up. Can you hear me, Brian? Yep, now I can. Okay. Yeah, someone keeps muting the whole room. So please, if you could stop. Uh, so so uh, Vanessa has one more question and then I'm gonna go to Mr. Newsom, and then I will go to Stephanie, Ste Steph Garver, Steph who Garver. is raising her hand who is waving at us, so I see that. So, and then we'll go, we've got a couple other ones after that. So, uh, Vanessa, your second question. Uh, we can't hear you, Vanessa, if you're still there. She, maybe she can come back. Has to unmute, okay. Uh, we still can't uh, there you. we go. I, you, I was you go. supposed to be unmuted by the host and then the host unmuted me. So I'm good <laughs> now. Um, <laughs> um, just uh, this is one that I sent in um, online, but it's how would you uh, how would how do you perceive the management companies that you have in right now as being able to um, to establish more independent information system for celebration billing, resident communication and other items. I know there was a, a conversation at one point in time to try and institute a, a Microsoft 360 so that everything could be all con contained in one. And um, how do you envision that they'll be um, working with the technology committee and doing that? Okay. Um, both, of the, both of the companies have extremely strong software and both are willing to work with our Microsoft 360, our, our Microsoft Teams platform. Um, so we will have better access to all of our information and also move forward with the implementation of Teams. So if anyone from technology would like to answer, I know Kevin, Brian, any other comments on that? The nope. Part of the challenge here becomes how do you want to define independence? Because sometimes when people define independence, it almost can boil down to do we want to have our own software system and everything so that we're managing our own billings, managing our producing our own accounting and everything like that, and use the other um, the company for other things that complement that? Almost like you know, there's the conversations going on about incorporation. Do we want to be our own city or town manager or something like that? That is a difficult conversation. What we have erred towards here is two companies that, and we think one of them stronger than the other, but that have very good software technological capabilities for this point in the game. And then the question becomes, how do we as a community want to evolve? One of the things we as a board have been concerned about is we had the charter review project, Vanessa, which you were a key part of, you know, leading to March of 2020, we had COVID and then we've had the RFP and now we're going to go through a transition. So we've had three years of massive projects, massive change. We almost need, I believe, a period of time here when we let the transition get completed, we stabilize the thing, and we almost rethink the strategic endeavor about what we want our vision to be for celebration when we go, let's say, four or five years out. We've had a lot of change, a lot of activities. You've got a lot of people who have put in too much time, to be honest with you, and, and how do we balance it out and let it stabilize? That's an honest answer, Vanessa. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go to um, Mr. Newsom. I think you're already unmuted. I am. Thank you. Um, it, the process, it seems, is a, a very um, a very good one. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you have checked the references of these companies and the direct references, at, at least, being the homeowners associations. But I, I wonder if we have information on the homeowners in those communities and how they feel about these two firms, not the homeowners association, but the homeowners themselves. 
And I'm, I'm not sure there is a, a, an agency that, that rates that or surveys that, but um, you know, they could be doing a great job for the homeowners association and they could be having some problems with, uh, with the homeowners. Uh, so any insight you could provide there, I would appreciate. Um, we, we did several different reviews of the companies. We had a legal review where we um, had our, um, our celebration legal team, our legal person, attorney review the companies for anything that they thought would be a problem. We also ask for references as part of their presentation. And, that's we, and then we also had some confidential references, but most of them, I will say, were from board members, not necessarily right. uh, from residents. I think you, uh -huh. um, there's not a really good way of getting that information from the residents. Um, if any other, when any person has a comment, I'm just not sure how we would have got, how we would get that information, but I do understand your question. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, I feel it's important. Now, I, I did uh, do a little bit of research online and um, couldn't find any uh, sort of homeowner um, ratings from one of the companies, but I did for uh, the other. And um, I have no idea whether it was a really good survey or not, but it was, uh, it was not as strong, shall I say, as, as you would hope. So that raised the question um, in my mind, uh, you know, are the homeowners satisfied? So I, I would just encourage you to, uh, um, to uh, see if you can, you know, find that information. I know it's late in the process, um, but it might be worthwhile. Um, I wish I had, uh, you know, knowledge of a, a rating agencies that did that, but I don't, and there may not be any. So Okay. That's just a concern I have that I wanted to, to bring up and and um, encourage you to, to look into that further. Very good question. We will Thank see you. what we can do. Uh, the next question was going to be from Steph. Win, from Steph. Yeah, it's Steph Garber. Steph Garber, can you unmute yourself? She had actually raised her hand. She was waving thank at us. Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you so much for doing this. Um, I have been in favor of this for a long time, and I'm sure it was an enormous amount of work. You've done a great job also of keeping us as residents informed. Um, the one concern I have is after serving on the advisory board for the Osceola County Public Libraries, when the library um, outsourced, so in other words, our county library is totally outsourced to a company. And when they did that, the company that got the contract uh, has proprietary software. And what, I think what has happened with that is it almost makes it impossible to get rid of them. Um, what would be in place to, allow us to keep control of the software that would be used and the transition of such uh, should another company be chosen at a future time. And I'll mute myself to hear the answer. Okay. Uh, well, this initial contract is for three years. So we do have a three-year contract um, and with the option of renewing for two additional three-year periods of time. Uh, we did ask the question because they do have proprietary software with both companies that we are using, but we have asked the question about owning our own data. And both companies have said that they are willing to allow us to own our own data. So as part of our contract, there is a section that talks about if they were to lose the contract or we would go with another company, the guidelines for what they have to turn back to us and the time period. So that is completely spelled out in the legal contract where we would be able to get our information back from their proprietary software. Um, Brian, did you want to add to that comment? Yeah, I actually would probably answer it slightly differently. It, when we, st and I was also on the charter review work and I was on the RFP work and we were curious when we really got into the heart of the RFP, would there be a lot of interest? Was there a cachet to celebration or was there not a cachet to celebration? 
what we learned, and we've learned it in spades even more as the process unfolded recently, is having celebration is a very important thing. Um, People are stunned that we're sitting here having done what we've done because entities the size of celebration just don't change. And the reason they don't change is because it's a whole lot of work. I think from the perspective of switching data systems, what we've actually learned is switching the data system is not that hard. There are good companies out there with good software. When you really get down to it, there's not that many software database type platforms. People put their own sexy wrappers around it and that to make it a little more efficient, stuff like that. I'm comfortable that some using somebody's software is not the issue. The real issue becomes how much appetite can a community have for the amount of change that this requires? Because Diana said it's taken thousands of hours. It, it honestly has taken thousands of hours. I, I don't think I can do this again in my career. Um, and, and I think a lot of people would tell you the same thing. So this is the kind of thing you don't do every three years. You do this every 10, 15 years, being perfectly honest. And if we're going to do a real fair transition, I think software will work perfectly fine. I think it is the softer parts of service that will take time. And you really probably need a good 12, 18 to 24 months to figure out how that all works well. Because you can only do Founders Day once a year. You can only do July 4th once a year. The, you know, the, the holiday season around Christmas, New Year's and all that, only can do it once a year. So you, you go through a couple of cycles, you get the service stuff there which is why we have aired our thing towards obviously financial matters, but we've also really aired it towards, okay, somebody who's got really good software because then you can be more attentive on the other service type items that build around it. And I don't know if that really helped you, but it really is, that is how we ended up thinking about it. Um, Before we move on, any additional? Yes. Nope. Yeah. Okay, just um, one, one other comment. Um, my RFP task force has sent me a text that I did fail to mention that as part of the review of the companies, we did ch also check the Better Business Bureau so we could get some responses back from possible residents in the community. So I'm sorry I did not include that in my statement. Okay, next three questions are from Jim, Laura, and then Jeffrey. So Jim Barrett, could you unmute yourself? Hi, it's Jim Barrett. Terraces at East Village condominiums. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go right ahead. So my question uh, is in two parts. One of the companies uh, being considered uh, for, this, for this contract is currently the management company at the Terraces at East Village Condominium Association. I was wondering if that came up in any discussions with both of these companies. Uh, yes, it did come up. Okay, and then my follow-up question was, are there any concerns or conflicts of interest with two contracts, I guess, at the same, at, within celebration? You know, um, it is actually pretty much standard business practice that that happens a lot, where there's a master association as Carla is, and then there's condo associations under that. It seems like it's a pretty normal thing that happens in the industry. So we don't really have a lot of concerns about that um, because we did look into that and we know we are, we're aware that they have, they manage parts of celebration under the, with, that aren't part of the master association. Any other comments about that? That's true for each of the companies. Yes, both companies do. Each company has that. Okay. All right. Okay. So, thank you. You're thank very you, welcome. Thank you, Jim. Next one is Laura Simpson. If you could unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. This is Laura Simpson and I uh, live at 600 Golf Park Drive. First of all, I also want to say hats off and thank you very much to all the board members. I know this has been an exhaustive process, especially during a pandemic, but also one that was really needed. And I thank you all for taking the time and uh, doing it. So bravo. First of all, we know that our town, being it was a Disney town in the beginning, is a very complicated town with lots of alphabet soup groups. And we also know we, the people that live here have very, very high expectations because people wanted to live here since it was the Disney town. Knowing this, I'm sure you've picked out two really great companies to choose from and certainly one that would be a feather in their cap. 
But my question is, what, how long do you think the expectation we as homeowners should have on how long it will take the members of these two different groups, depending on which one gets it, to train their staff and understand what we want before they become effective? And more importantly, will there be one person that will get calls that will be able to quickly figure out what group you should go to? With so many new homeowners moving in, and even I've lived here from, I'm a pioneer. I can tell you that when a water main breaks in my back alley, it's calling six different entities to get it fixed. So it's very, very complicated. We have a very complicated process here in celebration. So I know there's gonna be a huge training curve to get there. So I guess, you know, what do you think the training is gonna be? Who's gonna do the training? And more importantly, who's gonna be the person that will be there to help Obviously, these people know how complicated we are. Yeah. Okay. Jackson Mummy is offered to answer your question. From, from one founder to another. Um, the part of the process of transition is that the board has identified three of us to act as transition liaisons. And that's Cindy and David and myself. And one of the things that we are focused on is precisely your question. It's how to help explain the culture and the technique and the specifics of the alphabet soup to the eventual management company. I think that the transition will happen in stages, but I think you will all be impressed with how quickly either of these companies can understand the community. They both spent a great deal of time in the community quietly, <laughs> um, staying here, uh, visiting, talking to people, getting a sense of this, but we have given those companies one point of contact with the board to help them understand where to look for the information that they need. And so this is also an opportunity for us as a board and a community to begin to simplify some of this patchwork craziness that we've got and to start really asking from the beginning, does that make sense? Are we doing things in a good way or a bad way? I did a session for lifelong learning a couple of years ago on the, the, that very subject. We recorded it and we sent that video to both companies and they went, are you kidding me? You know, this, this is nuts here. Mm -hmm. So they recognize what they're coming into, but the quality of the people at both management companies is extraordinarily high. They are really professionals. They understand a great deal about development districts like Celebration. And I think that they are going to impress the residents. And I think you're going to see almost an instantaneous change in culture, but I think you're going to see a really good transition. And, and that's what we're committed to doing. Well, that would be a bravo. And like, for example, we need for our town, we need something as simple as one events calendar. The fact that we now only have it in the magazine comes out for what rec and sports handles, but all the independent groups that have events in town, they never get on the calendar, which is ridiculous. There should be one calendar, we should be one town, one inclusive group, and we should honor and respect all people who have events that wanna be done and know where there's conflicts because we are still a small, town with a lot of people involved in a lot of things but right now you have to go to like 12 different places to figure out when's the garden club meeting when's this meeting you know uh, and everything else it's just so ridiculous and so confusing and it feels like there's favoritism given to anything that's attached to town hall and everybody else is a secondary citizen so I would applaud someone coming in looking at the alphabet soup and looking at the way we do things because it's so silo and I think the silos have to be burnt down. So I applaud you and I hope that our new group will come in and make it streamline this so we can all benefit. That's a very good, that's a very good way of describing it. So, um, Cindy, Cindy, I actually asked them during one of the breaks uh, that we had during our day's interview, the very same question, because years ago we did, because you know, I did work here for a while. Years ago, we tried to bring out all the, you know, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the foundation, blah, blah, blah. And we tried to get them to buy into, you know, let's collaborate, give us your calendars, we'll give you ours. So we don't schedule a big event when the Boy Scouts are having their spaghetti dinner. Right. Things like that. And they both said, you know, absolutely, we can do that. We have a calendar, you know, that you can expand or, you know, include whatever you want. So, you know, that would be a project, you know, we'd probably 
maybe even want to get some volunteers to try to, or, you know, at least get a good solid contact, you know, with the celebrators, with the Boy Scouts, whatever, that we could, if they didn't feed us the information, then we could, you know, get the information from, you know, proactively get it from them on a monthly basis. But I'm with you on that. And both of them were very excited. Laura, Laura, thank you for your questions. Let me just add to what Cindy and Jackson have just said. In terms of a new company coming in, I think what implicit in what they both said is those are fresh eyes. Mm -hmm. Those are fresh eyes. CCMC has its eyes and has its communities. Now we're going to draw from another company and their communities and their experience, but they come in brand new and don't understand CJC or Kanoa, et cetera. Uh, and so I think some fresh questions and some, some revisiting. But let me tackle your other question about staff, because you said, how long is it going to take come in? How long is it going to take to train staff? Mm-hmm. So these companies are going to come in with a designated whoever's chosen is going to come in with someone who's going to be their point person, whoever that is. And then they're going to go through a search to find an executive director. That person is, you know, some national search. Actually, both companies are already already doing the national search. They started that weeks ago. Uh, So, and the board has uh, decision-making on that executive director. But the other staff are going to be some of the, so they're going to be talking with all the current staff. So a lot of the faces are going to change. I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of the faces are going to stay the same. The culture will change because it's a different company with a different management company, a different management culture. Um, and so that'll be, you know, fresh eyes. Um, but a lot of the faces will be, will be the same. So in terms of training staff, a lot of them know their jobs. They may be in different roles. We don't know how that's going to work out. That's up to the, whomever gets hired. And then training in their culture, and then the celebration ways, and um, uh, so 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 a lot of it's going to be jump started for them. It's not like brand new people coming on that's never walked the celebration streets or boardwalks before. Thank is you. That, is that a fair way to say yes, it? Yes, I think that is. Thank you very much, Laura. Appreciate Thank you, Laura. your comments. Thanks. All right. So the next order is Jeffrey, Jeannie, and Shelley. Actually, it should be Wendy and Dave. There were some comments. Oh, I'm sorry, Wendy. Uh, Wendy's question was, you've done so much research and work to find these two. Besides this open meeting, what are your other sources for making this decision? Well, there were financial reviews. Um, the board, the, the board of seven, and then the three committees that you uh, cited, the RFP task force and the mm-hmm. finance committee and the technology committee, each reviewed that same proposals. So if, if you will, 20 some individuals reviewed these many, many page proposals. Of course, we talked about the references. We talked mm-hmm. about the legal checks, the Better Business Bureau. Uh, they, six of them came for a site visit. So we had informal discussions then. Uh, mm-hmm. And then the interviews and the dialogue there and then the two site visits. So it's it's been pretty doggone extensive. And, mm-hmm. and I should also say that the companies, both of them have commented, oh my gosh, what a <laughs> thorough process i don't know that we've seen this before yeah. i don't think they've gone through quite this process so it, so it's it's been it's been pretty go ahead and, and one thing I would add is this is a small enough industry that some of us have called people in the industry and have done behind the scenes references on both companies too yeah yeah okay very good she did have a follow-up question that said yes it's, you've been terrific uh what is happening between now and Monday um I know in my point of view, we're, we're continuing to answer questions and then going back and re-looking at all the information that I've been provided and all the information from the interviews to see where my vote will land on Monday. So I'm sure the other board members, we don't have anything formal scheduled between now and Monday, but it's an individual re-review of what we've already done. And maybe some sleepless nights. And it could be, yeah, yeah. it could be. All right, next <laughs> question <laughs> is to Jeffrey. Can, so it's Jeffrey, Jeannie, and then Shelly. And then we'll go to Steve Northridge. Um, I think David, um, Brian answered his questions online. Okay, Jeffrey. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, he needs to. There, ha- he needs yeah, so, there we go. There we sorry, go. Sorry, we got to keep the security. Oh, nice house. Jeff. Nice house. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's not that yeah, not, that's not celebration. Thanks <laughs> for uh, putting this whole call together. It's really appreciative and being able to ask ask questions, answer questions. It's really great. Um, 
And this whole process is amazing. I'm so glad that it's being addressed and you're taking the time and effort to do this. So cheers to all of you and hooray for doing it. Um, I have two questions. And Dave, I think you kind of answered my first question, which is relative to the executive director or what we used to call town manager. We've had some really great people in the past that has made celebration really um, fantastic because of their um, dynamic ability to communicate and to be out in front and be out and you know considering people being accessible to um, people with phone calls and responsive to to different groups and I'm just wondering if either one of these companies or both of them have come forward with somebody who's uh, already uh, very dynamic and could fill the fill that role in a very positive way. I think that's a very important aspect of whatever company is coming here is the personality and the person that's leading the group. Um, but I think you've answered the question by saying there's going to be an executive director uh, search going on, and that hasn't been Jeffrey. Decided. I think. I think you just articulated exactly what the board is thinking on that executive director. It has to be a dynamic person who can manage at a high level, who's a town manager level person. And we've, we've kind of opened up to both companies and told them they're allowed to use the name celebration now to go out and recruit so they can start getting those great resumes. Um, but we have some, both companies have a great transition plan to put someone in here who can handle that going forward. I think uh, Brian and David both yeah. had comments, but then we can- so just, let me, just, just Go ahead, David, then I'll follow you. Yeah, do dovetailing on, on Jeffrey, your, your point. One of the things that's important to the board is for the executive director to be doing very positive, proactive outreach to the other entities in town. Sure, managing the HOA, but working very collaboratively and forward thinking with the CCDD and the Celebration Foundation and the schools and the county. So it's not just, it, it, it's all for the benefit of our residents, but it's not just with residents. It's the external community within which we all live. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer, I wanna follow up on the executive director, but I'll just go a little bit broader on personnel because I think it probably people are curious. Diana and I have had two meetings with all of the town hall staff. And at one of the meetings, all of the rest of the board members were there. And we made it known, you know, we really do like the staff. We do really want them to be part of this going forward and everything. And we have stressed that very strongly to both companies in the meetings that we've had and really strongly in the recent meetings we've had with them. On the subject of the executive director, we really want somebody who is going to fit well into their culture and the vision that they have that they want to implement. We we spent a lot of time talking about who they had that could fill that job on an interim basis, whether it be for two months, four months, or even six months, because we want to make very certain that we um, get the right person and have a very collaborative process with a lot of input from people uh, in getting the right executive director. And we, we understand how important it is and we wanna take the time to do it right. And that's really, Jeffrey, is what I'm really trying to say is we don't want, we don't want an answer in two weeks. We want the right answer in the proper amount of time. And we spent a lot of time worrying about how we manage in the interim until we get there. Great. Great, thank you. And my second question, last question, we've, and this is particularly to my role as town architect, um, we've been through a lot of learning pain and work with our staff and the smart web, which was such a brilliant move to go online with many of the more um, standardized or rudimentary kind of review processes. There's a lot of work that goes into that and a lot of transition between administrators, administrators of the process. And I'm, I'm hoping that that um, uh, legacy and work effort can, that learning curve can be transitioned quite easily through, through this new company. I, I'm hoping also they'll be able to even support you even better with the pro online process. The technology. The technology is even going to be better. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeffrey. Very good. Thank you. Um, so we have Thank Jeannie, you. Shelley, and then Steve Northred has an online question. So Jeannie, you can unmute yourself. Hello there. 
Hi. Hi. This is Jeannie at 106 Grace. I just wanted to thank all the board members too um, for all the hard work that you've done. So um, my question kind of piggybacks um, uh, um, Laura Simpson's question and a little bit of Gregory too. Um, so we're talking about the culture changing um, in terms of the staff and the transition. So I was wondering about that transition, what would be like a time frame would be the first kind of question. And then this, the second one would be, if, if we are trying to change the culture, is it only going to be the executive director who would be responsible for doing that if all the staff are going to remain the same? Does that well, make sense? Right. Um, okay. The transition time period, as soon as we make the final vote and to get all the approvals in process, the transition time will start. So um, that will happen over the next 90, 120 days, whatever it takes to get transitioned and get everything we need, you know, logistically from one company to the next. Transitioning the staff is going to be, um, we have asked for on, on-site support from the companies and both of the companies have, some, have uh, agreed that they will have on-site offices. And I think having people in town on-site will help with that training and changing, um, bringing, the new, bringing our current staff or the new staff up to the standards that we're looking for in the community. We also, in our statement of work, have added additional staffing. So we're not going with, we have additions added to the staffing model. So there'll be, well, there'll be similar staffing, but there'll be additional staffing added with the new contract. And um, it is going to be a transition in philosophy as well as just the logistical operation side of it. So we understand that. And I would say that, you know, David had said earlier that, you know, it could take a year and 18 months as everyone gets up to speed and we change um, the way things are done in the community with the new software and the new management company. So um, hopefully we won't have a lot of stumbles along the way but we will have a change in, in, in team and in leadership. And, and transition doesn't end when one contract ends and the next yeah. one begins. Transition will continue. Some things, I mean, a, a lot of the homeowner records will be, you know, should be live on day one of the new contract because there's some shadowing that happens that they've explained. And they, again, these companies have experienced this before. Uh, but we also, and they have in their own transition plans, which was very important to the board, is what happens 30 days after they formally start, you know, formally, it's all on them. And what happens 60 days and 90 days? So they've outlined a lot of this from their experience. And again, we'll be keeping the community updated with our frequently asked questions and maybe other town hall meetings. And, and of course, the board meetings continue with, with business as usual and unusual. Um, me, so, so I think, but yeah. yeah, I think it's going to take a while to get the. the Brian's culture. trying to jump. Let me, in. Let, me, let me jump in because it's important when we talk about transition to talk about the near term versus a longer term. So, in the near term, transition means getting the HR department of the newer company working with the HR department of CCMC because we've got to remember these are CCMC employees until we actually have the transition date. We're actually talking with CCMC about what would be the perfect CCM transition date. Maybe we move our plan even a little bit there. You know, then, you know, we've got to get to data conversions and stuff like that. And we, we really go through this sensitive process of everybody trying to work together without offending anybody until the magic date. We spent a lot of time in the interviews really trying to understand from a cultural perspective what was not going to be the involvement of the executive director, but of people outside of the executive director. Because if the executive director ends up not being a former um, Grand Manor or Century employee, that person doesn't know the culture and needs the involvement of the people from Plano, Texas or Longwood, Florida and everywhere else in between. And we spent a lot of time on that. And that is really where we want to force the effort and make sure that we carefully manage the process. Okay. Can I say? Yes. Um, so I think what you're also, uh, at, oh, sorry. <laughs> I tend to project. Um, I think what you're also asking is how these transitions will affect the employees and how, how will they be brought up to the standards of the new company? Each of these companies 
is very, very customer service oriented. And they've made their software even, their software even reflects that. It's good for the people that are working here because you don't have five different systems to sign into. It's all integrated. Um, it should speed up processes for people. They have uh, training um, mechanisms that besides, you know, they have you know, webinars, they have, you know, all kinds of training things in place to teach the people, you know, this is our culture. This is, you know, this is how we would like you to answer the phone. This is how you respond to this. I mean, they have got it down to a science, um, which is not to say that our folks aren't doing that. But I mean, it's, they're both very, very high customer service businesses. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So we have Shelly, then we have Steve Northridge online and Laurel. Shelly, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thanks for taking the time to put this meeting together for myself as well as all the other residents. We know that it's very important. And I'm not sure you may have I think you've already answered some of my questions in a way that I can understand, but maybe not the question in particular. So response time. I know that I have been on the front porch, the Facebook front porch, and I've seen a lot recently where people are trying to contact town hall and they're not getting a response. So is there anything with either one of these companies that particularly sticks out to you as far as how they communicate with their residents and how quickly they communicate with their residents. I know you guys couldn't go and ask the residents, how do you feel about the, your management company? But was there any indication that when a service request comes in or a person has a problem with whatever, that the response time is two hours or four hours or one day? Jackson's ready Here. to answer that question for you. I have, a, I have, oh, maybe you have a, okay. all of them. You can incorporate all of it. Okay. Um, also, the number of personnel. So uh, I think that what is also happening when people say they can't get through to town hall, it's typ typically a covenants issue. And I will tell you that I'm on the covenants committee. So when that becomes an issue because there's not enough personnel to staff the amount of letters that we're sending out, and then my next statement or question to that would be, one thing that I've said all along in our covenants meetings is, we need to have a standard. And if the standard is X, because that's what our guidelines say, when we send a letter to the resident, the resident needs to be told exactly what we're asking them to do. And we need to be specific and we need to do it the same for every resident. So it gets communicated the same way every time. Um, we haven't really done a great job of that. So I got a letter. It said, you need missing or dying landscape. It didn't say which missing or dying landscape. It didn't say what I was supposed to replace it. And, and so I'm saying to you from a customer service perspective, if we do better at that, we will get less calls. If we get less calls, we may need less people, but right now we're not getting to everybody. Um, so we're not being clear, we're not being concise. And I'm not sure if either one of these two companies works with committees the way we are set up. Like maybe they manage their own thing and they make their own rules and they have their own standard letters that they send out. But do they work with committees like what we have? Um, so Jackson wants to answer that. So I'm going to let him answer that. And I think Brian's unmuted himself. But yes, they do work with committees. So Jackson. Yeah, they, they do. I, I was in uh, Texas with Brian at Grand Manors. I spent time in the call center. The average wait time was 16 seconds to get a phone call answered. And it was answered professionally and with detailed information about that community. It was customized to the community and it was handled in a way that I think any resident in celebration would be thrilled to have that kind of communication and responsiveness. I certainly agree, Shelley, that it's important to be responsive. And I agree that having the right number of people is important. I will say that the software that I've seen takes the place of some humans on staff for the very reason that you described. We saw a system in which an inspector takes a iPad, they take 
uh, geolocated from the site of the home. They've got a list of items that are specific to the covenants of celebration. It's specific, they take the pictures, it generates a letter and we can customize that letter and it gets sent out from right on the spot. It doesn't have to go back into an office and work through a bunch of people. So th these are not perfect solutions, but they will move us closer to what I think we want, which is a better relationship between residents and all of the committees and all of the uh, procedures that we use and a way to make residents feel truly special and welcomed in their own community. So I appreciate the question. Um, I, I think it's something that regardless of which company we hire, you will see uh, a difference in, in the approach. So I'll throw it over to Brian who will undoubtedly. Well, I was gonna add one. I was, said, well, I was just gonna add, that was good. <laughs> let me add one short comment. Um, the RFP was never about a staffing issue or reducing staffing. It was about getting the right amount of staff to do the work that is in the statement of work, which includes covenant enforcement. So we feel like we've got that along with the software that the new company is going to implement, whichever company it is. So it's, again, it's not a, it's not a, we're, we're not looking at headcount. We're looking at statement of work. Okay. Brian, go ahead. Uh, oh, Jackson, I thought did a very good job of but they also track emails coming in too. I mean, the answer today is with the software we have today, we've asked how many phone calls we get and the staff is having to go through and try to figure out how to count calls on a log or something. We, we looked at something that actually tracked real time, how many calls are coming in, how fast they were being responded. If they needed to be referenced, it said, okay, it needs to be referenced and it needs to go to covenants or it needs to go to accounting or it needs to go to payables or something like that. And they also track how many emails are coming in and where they're getting routed and stuff like that. It's just, and it's the, the beauty of it is it's the utilization of automa, automa, I'm talking really well here, automation to make the employee more efficient. We clearly need to add more employees. We, we don't argue that, especially in the area of inspectors and stuff like that. We need to do a better job of doing that. And we actually purposely delayed it a little to tie it into the RFP process. Um, but we, we know to need to do that, but we actually believe in concert with the software, it gets us there or a lot closer. Yeah, one, one other addition to that, I thought, again, Jackson's point really covered that. But it also, with, with the portals that we've looked at, again, with the six finalists and now down to the two, with the portals that residents can go to and look, it's like, what's the status of my ARC application? Or what is the status? I haven't heard. Well, I can go look. I mean, it should have generated an email, but what if I didn't see the email? I can go look. Oh, there it is. Or, oh, look, I, I got flagged for you know the, the plants outside or whatever it was. Um, so, so it's all integrated. It's, it's uh, e with either company. It's going to be marvelous. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, thank you very much, Shelly. The next question online is from Steve Northridge. Do we have any visibility on how the selection of a new company may impact our homeowners fees? Uh, Brian's going to raise that. I, I'm going to have him answer that since he's in the middle of completing the budget for next year. Okay, it's a it's a great question. It's a shocking question. We didn't think anyone would ask that. Um, <laughs> the answer is it's going to affect homeowners' fees. Yes. Um, okay, so the reality of the matter is, is we the board are doing the 2022 budget. I, I was central for the last three years in my role in doing and really driving the process in 1920 and 21. So it was pretty easy to pick it up. And both companies wanted us to do the budget. When you really look at our budget, there is the compensation areas. And when I talk about compensation, I'm talking about compensation to the management company. And as a reminder to everybody, all the employees are management company employees. So it could be direct salaries, it could be benefits, it could be the management fee that we pay to the managing company, um, taxes related to workers' comp or something like that. And then other areas like um, Yellowstone and New Leaf do our um, landscaping. We've got celebration and sanitation and stuff like that. What both companies really want is for us to give them a budget. So from a board perspective, and I've shared a little with the finance committee, we've really looked at a big picture budget and inflation is up. Inflation's up about 5%, 5.4%. If you look at where we're at on a year-to-date basis, 
I, we have been trying for the last few years to do an inflation increase. I think we're going to have an inflation increase. We did a lot of negotiating with the companies. There may be a small increase on top of that. I'm not expecting a huge increase. Um, there will be an HOA increase to get services where they want to be. And we will finalize that as we go through the process, but that gives you a flavor for where it's really at. It's really inflation, maybe plus a small amount. We've pushed and shoved hard with the companies about fees and stuff like that, which was beneficial. Um, and that's kind of where we're at. Okay. All right. All right. And the budget gets finalized and we vote on it in October. October. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, Laurel, you're up next. Hi there. Thank you uh, to the board and the committees. I haven't been overly involved, though I did get on and watch uh, some of the meetings and videos after the fact. So thank you for for some of that. I haven't hit all of it, so my apologies if this is a repeat question. But obviously, um, one thing that comes up a lot, even on the uh, Facebook pages, et cetera, and personally that I've um, dealt with is, is sort of the covenants aspect. So my question is more just when you were vetting or even getting down to the two final companies, were you able to walk properties and sort of get a feel for factually, how good were they on covenant enforcement? Um, how well did their properties appear to be maintained? That type of thing. So that's kind of a more general question. I'm thrilled to hear some of the advances on the um, software and so forth that I think will make this a more equitable and efficient process, but uh, just kind of did you lay eyes on things? So that would be one question. And the second piece is, you know, I say, of course, we're unique. I mean, I think there are a lot of mixed use um, uh, associations, et cetera. So my second question is, is did you have a sense that both companies or one more than the other had experience with uh, our particular town center, and I'm assuming it will be similar in Island Village moving forward, mixed use situation where you're really in this split between a commercial um, and a residential homeowners association that has to sort of figure out how to, you know, cover all aspects of a building when it's kind of chopped up. So uh, did you feel like one had a strength more than the other? So that's kind of the general question. Thank you. Yeah. Jackson wants to jump in and answer those. Thanks, Laurel. Um, let me first start about the, the property walk. Um, there was a lot of work done to assess communities that these companies manage already. And that included talking to their boards and to their vendors and, and others. But we did something a little different here, which was that Celia and I uh, did a three hour bus tour with each of the companies. And we went through the entire community and we got out of the bus and we walked and we talked and we walked through downtown. And we said, what do you see here? What, what you know, and really got them to look at it. And, and I'll be candid, some companies said, oh, we don't see anything wrong at all. And those two companies, the, the two companies we selected said, we see things that could be improved. Right, right. And they were much more rigorous. And, and Celia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think <laughs> these two companies were very spot on and clear eyed about what was going on. And they brought property managers in to walk and tour with us. So I was, I was pleased with that. Um, to your, your second question about mixed use associations. Absolutely. This community, as you know, is crazy uh, from a, a governance standpoint. And there aren't a lot of those because Disney created this community and really wrote the statute in Florida for this community. However, both of these management companies have worked in and managed communities like uh, Baldwin Park, Park, Lake Nona. Um, and so they've got some smaller version because there just aren't a lot. I mean, if you if you look at it, there probably aren't 25 companies in America or communities in America that really resemble celebration in size and complexity and notoriety. So we're dealing with a really small subset there. But Celia, you you were on the tour. Maybe you want to comment to that as well. Yes, I'd like to comment. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, um, about the tour, Laurel, we did 18 hours of tours with these companies and we hit every single part of celebration you can imagine from 
Island Village, right into town center. We got off at the Bank of America and toward the companies down Market Street, over to Lakeside. And they looked up an awful lot as we toured those streets to see what the units upstairs look like, to see what the, the stores, the commercial, they've seen every part of Celebration. And these two companies were, they asked more questions. And J thankfully, Jackson was on this tour because he's a founder and he was able to answer the detailed questions of our community. You can tell they were truly engaged and they were truly concerned about things that they saw in our community. So I think as a board member, I'm so privileged to be part of this process, but as a resident, I, I'm so comfortable with how we are going in the, in the right direction moving forward. Thank you, Celia. Okay. Are there any other questions that are out there? I don't see any other hands raised. So if you've been waiting, now it's time. Now's the time, just raise your hand. No? Okay, David, did you have um, some of the questions that had been submitted online? Or Kevin's well, offer? So, so someone asked, and, and we'll address this in the FAQs, why did the board find it necessary to change the management company after using the current one for 25 years? I'll take a stab at that. Um, well, first of all, we, we were, had, we, had we already had, well, we were, we didn't, we weren't, um, required to change management companies, but we did go out to, the we went out for the RFP. And then when we had the six finalists, um, our current management company was part of the six finalists and gave a, a presentation on where we would continue uh, along with the other ones. And they had some really stiff competition and there was some really great, great proposals that we got a chance to review. And we made the commitment to go with the, the company that we felt was going to best meet celebrations needs going forward. Um, Brian, you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's important to state here, CCMC has been an integral part of celebration for 25 years. Celebration owes a lot of thank yous to CCMC for where we are as a community. They behave very professionally through this whole RFP process. And even after they weren't a finalist of the final two interviews, they behave very professionally. We had six finalists and, and CCMC was one of the six finalists. Um, very good company. We got down to really, in my mind, just small discern discernible differences, but software and the efficiencies around software and a call center and stuff like that, really we thought helped us leapfrog to another level from a service perspective and it's you know we really had it down to a final six that were all outstanding and then the small differences and then it really became a question for the board to think about okay do we really try to drive a culture change and that is where we made the hard decision what I, yeah, think. I think and I, it was just said at the beginning part of this was driven by the whole statement of work that the whole revamping it was not the statement of work that we have today patched together again, it was rewritten. It was totally rewritten. A lot of the elements are in the current statement of work, many new elements. And then as Brian and Diana have said, looking at the six that ended up on it, it, with the proposals to us, uh, these two really jumped out. So it wasn't necessary to change it. We just found that this was gonna be most appropriate for moving us the way we as a board and trying to represent the residents in the community, trying to move us forward after these first 25 years. All right, uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Other, Kevin, did you have anything? That, Cause I know you you had some questions out there as well. Or did you ask, or did David, you have them? Well, we've talked, one of the questions, how will the new management company retain the staff that has historical knowledge and a well-rounded understanding of celebration? You know, again, uh, they'll be talking with current staff uh, once a decision is made. And, and then I think the, whomever the new management company will be will engage And someone talked about this. It may have been Steph Garber talking about committees, uh, but it, talking with the different committees. I mean, it's not a matter of doing the ARC process brand new. It's not taking covenants and doing it brand new or special events brand new. It's 
It's, uh, and then technology, which is brand new for us, like two years old. So again, it's engaging the committees also is, as they figure out some best ways of moving forward, acknowledging the historical knowledge. Very good. Now, um, at this point, like we said earlier, we will post Q and A's on the town website. Um, we will, the videos for both of the companies will remain up as well. Uh, the next, you know, there's always, you can always submit questions to the CROA email address, which some of you have already done that. So we appreciate that as well. Um, it does look like I, uh, before I sign off here, it does look like we do have a question that was not fully answered. How will the new management company address resident within celebration condominiums associations that are not following the bylaws? As an example, large dogs within a unit of which the guidelines have a weight limit, a weight restriction. Um, I, I believe that would be a condo board mm -hmm. issue, yes. not the crow board. The crow board, I mean, if you live in a single family home, I believe that the uh, restriction on animals is the same as the county. So you can have three right. dogs or whatever and you can't breed them. But if it's inside a condo, condo that's, part of the condo association, whoever your association manager is for your condo, they would be the ones to enforce that. Yeah, we, we have a condo council and, and that's one of the places that we bring those things up and, and we would engage management so they're aware of it. But I think that again, in the, in the crazy patchwork quilt of governance that we have, you start with your condo association and then you, you move outward from there. So um, we're aware of that for sure. Very good. Um, okay. Any other questions? Uh, Laurel, I see you've raised your hand again. You're on mute, Laurel. There we there. go. There. Okay. Well, that uh, sparked my other, because I know Jackson had been working with us a bit on the condo council, and obviously now we'll be transitioning um, in terms of management company and software, but one issue that really permeates condos, but also across the covenants or enforcement stuff is the short-term rentals. Did you find that either of these companies had a system in place for um, checking for those things and uh, vetting, you know, kind of rooting them out? That seems to be where we have a real consistent uh, or issue with a consistent policy across you know, condos are trying to do some stuff and some people in neighborhoods are calling in, but there's no real uh, kind of consistent thing. I just didn't know if you'd found that either had a good experience or software to address a uniform policy on that that would help and, all of I know us. I that would raise this part as the tour. So Jack, yeah, I mean, we, we, we discussed it. Um, they do have uh, policies that they use. They have resources and services, as you know, Laurel, some of those are not good. <laughs> Some of those services are just not very helpful. Uh, we discovered that here, but they are very much aware of that particular concern that we've got. I think Island Village represents a real upcoming concern that we've all got about that. And so they're aware of it. Um, I don't know that anyone has within their own system a, a good way of checking this, except that they stay pretty engaged in those sites and they, they all talked about community involvement, right? The, the best way to know if you've got a problem is if somebody says, hey, in my building, this is happening. And I know you've been pretty proactive downtown about trying to, to help raise that uh, visibility. So I'm, I'm encouraged that we can attack that particular problem. And I thought both companies were pretty clear that that was something that had to be addressed here. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, you raised your hand again? I did, and I'm sorry, I just had one question to follow up with about the um, call center. So both of these management companies operate a call center and that call center is somewhere other than Celebration Florida. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I, I can certainly speak to, I didn't see Century, but Grand Manor's call center is spectacular. You would not know you're not talking to someone in celebration. That is, they've got the entire portal and all the information, and they've got a direct line into the town hall here. So I actually watched them patch in a resident asking a very detailed question that was beyond the scope of the portal. They did a speed dial to the assistant town manager. 
then connected the resident to that town manager immediately and put a note in the portal about that particular issue. So it was not only connected to that resident's record, but it was also for that community in case the question came up again. Um, and it was, it was pretty, it was pretty spectacular. I gotta tell you, um, I, I would have been thrilled to get that kind of a response if I'd called in. I, I can also tell you, and Cindy could too, that the call, because I, I saw the call center for Grand Manners and I saw the one for Sentry and the one from Sentry was on the exact same order that Jackson just described. And the CEO of Sentry gets a daily report telling about the speed at which you're returning phone calls and how many calls and the issues and stuff like that. So it's monitored all the way to the CEO level. And I guess I'm not worried about the, uh, the speed so much as the you know, people have a rapport with Jessica. I, you know, Jessica knows that I replaced my door hardware six months ago. So if I got a letter that says my door hardware wasn't right, you know, my first instinct would be to call Jessica. That's what we see a lot of times and that's what we hear. And, and so if Jessica weren't there and those people have that touchy feely, which I think is something kind of awesome about celebration is that we do have that touchy feely thing and i fear that we would lose that yeah I, I, I don't think we're gonna i don't think we're gonna lose that because the notes will be there they will see that even down to the point where they said we want to go through and understand how to pronounce the names of the streets and learn the locations and get the nuance of the community you'll have on-site management it's just that you'll be supporting your on-site management uh, whether it's Jessica or anybody else, with people that have more data at their fingertips. And there's a real value to having that. We overload our current management staff because everyone wants to talk to Jessica or to Susanna or to Patrick. And, and we have to support these people better than we have. And I think that this will do that. Um, I don't think we're going to lose what makes the town special and the community. I, I was here when there were 300 of us. And we all knew each other and we knew everybody in town. Now we're 15,000. We can still do a lot of those same things, but we need to make some economies of scale in my view. And I think that both of these companies will do that. So I would ask you to, to grant us a little bit of forbearance. That's always scary saving somebody <laughs> on covenants, but um, you know, give us a little time. And, and I think you're gonna be impressed with what we see. Well, and one of the things I, I've talked with um, about that, about answering the phone is, Usually the people that are up front, they're the people answering the phone and dealing with the the residents face to face. Yeah. And they are so torn and the staffing is not right that the phone continues to ring because they're dealing with someone face to face and having a great interaction, but they can't break away to answer the phone. So that's a staffing issue. And that's also what residents we hear that the phone is not getting answered. But there is a staff person there. They're just busy dealing with someone face to face. So and I just wonder is, if that will be what will happen because people will want that one on one interaction. So they'll they're less likely to call if they think they're going to get a call center than they are to walk in the front door of town hall to get their question answered. I think the quality of these call centers will alleviate that concern. But I appreciate you raising the hand. We well, do have one other person who has his hand up. Can I just, up. Can I just yes, say we have a couple comments. Yeah. And then we have one other person with their hand okay. up, I guess. Um, I had that same concern because, you know, for years I'd, I'd call here and I'd, Gabriella would answer the phone or she would see my number and she would know it was me. And you get that real personal, you know, touchy feely kind of thing. But after seeing I, what I saw at Century, I didn't go to Grand Manors, I went to Century. These people are very pleasant. They have more information at their fingertips than the ladies or gentlemen up front do. So you don't have to, you know, like, well, let me see if Patrick's here. No, he's here. Let me see if I can find Ryan. You know, you can get a, a quick answer. And if you do need to talk to Jessica, you know, you can talk to Jessica. Yeah. They have, their systems are so sophisticated that if you call and ask, you know, about your doorbell, your ring doorbell or whatever, they put it in the system when they're talking to you on the phone and that populates through any <laughs> anywhere that you would possibly want to look for that information or even be surprised to find it there, including your own portal. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's so you don't lose that, that history. You know, in fact, you probably will have more information because maybe one day you talk to Jessica and maybe one day you talk to Susanna and maybe one day you talk to somebody else. But with this, these systems, they are so, you know. 
Okay. Amazing. David, you had something to add, and then I also have a yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah just to finish up talking. on that. She was talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you talk? Were you just, Shelley? Were you saying something? You're muted. No. Okay. Yeah, just to finish up on that, I think that again we've talked about each of these companies having post day one plans. In other words, you know, they do the transition things, and then now they are in charge. And so they have plans. We're going to also be monitoring that. And, and we're going to be talking with residents and we're going to hear, hey, this isn't working so well, or this is working, this is working great, but here's another suggestion. So it's about continuous improvement. Very good. And then I had a, 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 something in the chat that said that Richard Nelson had his hand up for a question. And I don't see his hand up, but I didn't know if you still had a question. I didn't want to skip you. I'm going to ask to unmute you. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a, a comment about call centers. Um, Mirasol, obviously, um, I, I, I'm a I'm 500 Mirasol circle. I'm a resident and past board member at Mirasol. One of the comments I want to make is, is about call centers. We've had Grand Manors on the property for just about 20 months now. And I would say the most difficult thing you're going to find is getting people comfortable with and relying on call centers versus talking to management on site, et cetera, uh, which is exactly people coming in, you know, uh, coming in the, the Crow offices or coming down to the Mirasol offices uh, on site. Um, it, that has been a terrible transition. People are not comfortable with call centers. And whether the call center is great or it isn't great, it's a big, huge cultural change. And you need to be prepared for that because that kind of cultural change is not going to be made easy. Yeah, thank yeah. you for that comment. Yeah, and, and I think I think I think it goes back to Cindy's point earlier. It's going to be a hybrid, just like now is a hybrid. I mean, we're live and in person, but our residents aren't yet. We miss that, but it's not safe yet. So we're in a hybrid mode. I think that's going to happen. Brian's Brian's got his hand up there, and then we'll... to, to Rick's comment. Um... We actually did discuss that a little bit when we were with Grand Manners, and you actually have the flexibility to make the decision as to whether the call starts at the uh, call center or whether it starts at Celebration, the 851 building, and then if it doesn't get answered in so many rings, it goes over to the call center. So we can actually structure it to have Celebration employees first answer the phone if we want. It, it, your comment, I think, is 100% spot on correct we've got some flexibility to think about how to best use it. So, so, so just transitioning from that and, and, and looking at chat and knowing that we're running out of time, uh, something in the chat said, I think Kevin said, a lot of the questions or most of the questions that were asked ahead of time through email have been addressed in this dialogue as well as our frequently asked questions. But just to transition from Rick's point and Brian's comment, one of the written questions was really written to a management company. If we were interviewing them now, what would you change to make celebration even better for the residents? And just a reflection of that, I think we were asking that in our questions when we interviewed them a couple of weeks ago. And we asked about what might be another cornerstone for us. Um, you know, how are you going to make things better? And I think it's the priority of the board to do what's best for our residents and to, to make things better. Um, we don't wanna stay with 2021 or 2020, we wanna move forward. Um, and, and I think that either of these two choices uh, would help move us forward. We're, and I'm thrilled to be, to have this problem in front of us right now. Yeah, it's gonna be a tough decision because there are they're both very qualified companies and both extremely eager to jump on board and help us move into uh, beyond our 25th anniversary. So, all right, at this point, I see no further hands. So we are gonna say going, going, gone, right, except right, Brian right, has right, a right, comment. Right, Brian's right, hand right, is right, up, right. Brian. Yeah, 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 I wanna make one wrap up comment, at least from my perspective as a resident. The issue when we did back in 2017 when David was on the board 2017-18 and when we did charter was people wanted a real RFP process. Well, 
we have been doing this for a year. When you look at all the committees, the task force and everything like that, I could I can get to a number like 40, 45, 50 people. I can get to a number of hours that I'm sure would count in the thousands. Mm -hmm. We have tried to communicate painfully, uh, meaning, you, you know, we've just constantly tried to do it. And I, I mean, we've done, and I know we've done a good job of that because I'll be on a tee box and people will start talking with me about the RFP process, which is healthy. It means people are reading the things and doing things and stuff like that. So I really, you know, I'm following up on David's comment earlier, which is I really think we've tried to respect the spirit of what we were asked to do over the last two or three years. And I hope, I think we've got two very good companies. And I hope and would pray that we pick the best of the two, but I feel good about where we're at tonight. Very good. We had just at the height of this phone call, we had 38 residents online and we really appreciate the participation. Again, if you have any further questions, you can submit them to the CROA email address, the CROA board email address that was provided, that was on Town Hall website, would certainly uh, answer any question, any additional questions you have. And Brian must be reading something laughing up there. I see some laughing going on. Uh, again, thank you all very much. Um, we will do our best to make a great decision for you on Monday, and we will announce our decision. And once all the final approvals are um, done and completed, and then we move forward in the process. So thank you all, have a great evening and stay safe.